Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and in our mind. We thank you that you're continually bringing revelation. We thank you that we're taking hold of the word in these messages. We're applying it in our life and doing it. And we know that you're performing it and bringing forth much fruit. Thank you for all that you accomplished through it this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We've been sharing many messages that are very important, as we've been stating. We talked about our call. We talked about being chosen. We talked about being faithful. We talked about proving ourselves to be accepted. We've talked about how there'll be those that'll be rejected and those that'll be approved before God. We talked about those that'll be crowned. We're talking about spiritual growth now, about how we grow up spiritually through the Word of God, and we come out of just being brand new born babes in Christ, and we grow up by getting experience in the Word of Righteousness so we're no longer infants, and we grow up, and so we do what the Word says, we grow up to the place of, of beginning to conquer our enemies and see them be put underfoot to come to being a spiritual young men and women before God. And we're going to go on into spiritual man and womanhood to be the full stature of the man in Christ. And we're talking today, we began talking about perfection. God is going to take us to perfection. We talked about how to be perfect in the Old Testament this morning. We saw that the words there for perfection refer to being without blemish, being upright, being without spot, being undefiled. Because of that, that shows us that that's the exact same type of people without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, holy. They're going to be presented unto the Lord at the rapture, which is the catching up of the church when he presents them to himself, the glorious church. Who's that tell you is going to make it in the rapture in the glorious church? The ones that have gone on to perfection. Those are the ones that are going to be there. So, and God wants us to go on into perfection. Well, tonight we're going to continue on talking about in the New Testament. We see beginning here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles, or this is the beginning principles <clears throat> of the doctrine. The doctrine really is the word logos, which is word of the word of Christ that comes unto us. It says, let us go on unto perfection. You and I are to go on unto perfection in our life. And when he talks about going on, this is something that is going to be an ongoing process because this is a present tense verb. It is conditional upon you doing what is necessary to go on unto perfection. It will not happen automatically. This is why the subjunctive mood is there. A conditional statement depending upon you meeting the conditions. And you can't do it yourself. God's the one who does it. This is why it's in the passive voice. Therefore, it is conditional if we meet the conditions and we do the ongoing work necessary, God will accomplish this work and we will go on into perfection, maturity, into spiritual manhood and womanhood to be, the, be a part of the full stature of Christ that he's going to raise up in these last days. And he says, not laying again the foundation of these things, repentance from dead works and a faith towards God and the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. These are all foundational principles. We are going to go on unto perfection, moral and spiritual perfection in our life. That's what he is going to accomplish in your life. Now, as we do this, we go forth. We're going to walk in the ways of the Word of God. We're going to conquer and triumph over all our enemies. We looked at many principles from the Old Testament that are very important for us to see. We begin over here in Luke chapter 1, and we see in verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. His wife was the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Who's going to be with the Lord? Who's going to be presented? It's going to be the blameless ones, the ones who are free from fault, the ones that have no reason to be censured in any way, as it says. So walking in all the commandments, you and I now are to walk in the New Testament commandments, and we are to walk as those who are righteous, which are the ones who are doing the word of righteousness. <laughs> We see this is before, remember, the New Testament came into being. 
Well, after the New Testament came into being, Paul, who was considered the one who was the, one of the superior ones in the law, we see in Philippians chapter 3, speaking about Paul, verse 5, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, he was, you know, the top of the class in the law. Concerning zeal, he was persecuting the church as they were against the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. He followed it to a T, just like the other guys did that he talked about. But it didn't produce anything because he didn't, that won't produce it. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ and through the New Testament commandments and the work of God in our life to bring us to that place. Well, we see that the Old Testament could never produce it. The reason being is because it had no means to do it because first we must become a new creation in Christ. And you and I are going to go on into perfection. The covenant that we have now is a covenant that will bring us into perfection in the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, it says this, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, could it bring us to that place? That was the Old Testament. It couldn't do it. For under it the people received the law. If it could, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? That was the Old Testament order. But it could not produce it. So if somebody, a new one had to come in, and that was Jesus, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The reason being, because, of course, there was no change on the inside, and the Old Testament law was made for man after the flesh with all of its fleshly outward ordinances. We see in Hebrews 7, 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The Old Testament law was made for man after the flesh. The New Testament law is made for man after the spirit, with all of its spiritual applications, and it produces those spiritual results in our life to bring us into perfection in the Lord. We see over in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 9. Here it speaks of the first tabernacle that was standing in verse 8. This was simply a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service, all the priests, it not, could not make him perfect as pertaining to the conscience, because they didn't have a change on the inside of them. You know, when we, the New Testament brought a new spirit into us and a new heart, they couldn't be changed on the inside of them. Therefore, they, didn't, they could never produce it. As we see further in chapter 10, verse 1, the law having a shadow of good things to come, it was types and shadows of the reality that was going to come through Jesus Christ, but not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices, all the outward physical sacrifices of the Old Testament, which they offered year by year continually, it could never make the comers there into perfect. It could never bring us into perfection, which is what God's will is and what His design is for every single one of us. We get born again, that's just simply the entry into relationship with God, and then we begin to grow up in the things of the Word of God, and we begin to bring forth fruit, we go through the cleansing process, and we bring forth more fruit, we come to the abiding place of bringing forth much fruit, being true disciples of the Lord, and we overcome all sin, because sin has no dominion over us. We have authority, and we cast out all the demons, and we drive them out of every area, so we get free, and we come to liberty and victory in our life. These are all things that are necessary in order to bring us on into perfection, as you will see. Hebrews chapter 10 we see in verse 12, of course, the law could never make the perfect, bring someone perfect. So how could this happen? How could we go on into perfection? It's only through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, talking about Jesus, when he had offered one sacrifice, and this one means only one. This is the word mia, which means only one. Remember, they offered sacrifice year after year continually. Jesus only had to offer one sacrifice because he took all the sins upon himself. He offered one, only one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He'd accomplished this great work. For henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 
For by one offering, only one, again the word mia, only one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, this is important for us to look at for a moment. This is the perfection. It says, by this offering he has perfected forever. It looks like there are, we're already perfected them that are sanctified, past tense. Looks like it's already been accomplished work. But that's not what it's saying here. First of all, that he hath perfected forever is an accomplished work because of what Jesus has done. The reason why is because this is a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense means action completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. So he's saying he has completed in the past this perfecting work with results at the present time forever, otherwise it would carry on. So that says Jesus has accomplished that in the past, which has ongoing forever, forever effects. But then when we come to the next place, where it says that them that are sanctified, sounds like it's in a past tense, doesn't it? Well, this is where there's a problem. When we look at this word, it is not a past tense verb, which has led, led a lot of people astray, thinking that they're already perfectly sanctified. No. It's a present tense verb, a present tense verb, and so what it's speaking about is those that, the way you would translate the present tense is those that are being ongoing sanctified. Otherwise, it's a work in process. See, what Jesus sacrificed did it, he made it so that this perfection would, has already been accomplished through his work, but in order for it to be accomplished in us, that work has to be done. It's an ongoing work of us being sanctified. And it's the Lord who's doing the work because this is a passive voice, which means the subject is being acted upon by someone else. If it's talking about them, it's talking about the ones that come to the Lord, get born again, file, come into the New Testament. So Jesus, by his one offering, has accomplished perfection forever, and it will come into manifestation for those who are being sanctified in an ongoing basis. Otherwise, the Lord doing this work and accomplishing this great work. And being sanctified, as you must realize, you and I are set apart for the purpose of the Lord to bring forth what His purpose is, which is to bring us into perfection. Not just get born again and leave us there. No, He's going to bring us into perfection in our life. And that is what He is going to accomplish. Who does this work? Of course, it's the Lord who is doing this, but it can't be done without our cooperation. We have to cooperate. He's not going to do it just without us doing nothing. We get in his word, we do what he says in order to see this be accomplished. Now it's interesting, over in Matthew, chapter 13, verse 55, in speaking about Jesus, it says, is not this the carpenter's son? And this word is a form of this word for perfection. This one who brings the perfecting of something. Is not this the carpenter's son? Well, they're talking about Jesus. Well, in one sense, he's talking about Joseph. He's the carpenter, and his son would be talking about Jesus. Well, who is the father of Jesus? The real father is not Joseph. It is Jesus. This gives me the Heavenly Father in heaven is the Father of him. So, Jesus, the Father is the real carpenter who's accomplishing this work in our life through Jesus Christ. And he will accomplish it. Now, Jesus has a part to play because it's interesting that in Mark's account, it says something a little bit differently. It doesn't talk about the carpenter's son. Instead, this one says, is not this the carpenter? referring to Jesus as the carpenter. So when you look at those two together, it speaks of the Father as the carpenter, but also Jesus as the carpenter. And what's they doing? They're doing this perfecting work in order to accomplish this work of perfection to bring us into what God purposes for us. Well, how's this going to get done? It's going to get done through the working of Jesus Christ, through the Word of God in your life. In Matthew chapter 5, we see in verse 44. 
This is, by the way, in verse 43, where Jesus is speaking to them in this chapter, telling them, in essence, of the change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He says in verse 43, You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's from the Old Testament. That's the way it was. But now he's telling them the New Testament law, how it's changed. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. These are all commanding statements. We are commanded to love our enemies. So that means you don't do things to people based on how they treat you. That's the way they did it in the Old Testament. They love their neighbor and hate their enemy. The enemy was bad, so I'm not going to love him. It's based on their performance. It's not that way in the New Testament now. You do things unconditionally, and you give people what they have need of, not what they deserve. You love your enemies. You bless them that curse you. You do good to them that hate you. You pray for those that would despitefully use you and persecute you. What's going to be, those are commands now. What's going to be the result? That you may be, or this is the word ginomai in the Greek, which means become, that you may become, if you meet those conditions, loving your enemies, blessing those that curse you, doing good to those that have done evil to you and praying for those that have used you and so forth, that you may be, because this is a conditional, may become, that is, this is a conditional statement because it's a subjunctive mood, that you may become. The children really means the sons. You and I are becoming as sons, the sons of your Father which is in heaven. So if you do those four things, then the result will be you have met the conditions to become the sons of your father. For he makes his son to rise on the evil, on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He says, if you love them, conditional statement which love you, what reward have you? It's easy to love somebody that loves you. You're just responding to it. Do not even the publicans the same? Of course they do. If you salute your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Yeah, we're supposed to salute every person. He says, be, that you, be therefore perfect, it says in the King James. But what it really says is not to be perfect as a command. It sounds like it's a command. It is a future tense verb. They should not have made it as a command. It's not making another command to you. It already made the commands, the four things it told you to be that you might become the sons of the Father. What he's saying here is, as you do this, you sh shall, therefore, it's a future tense verb, you shall, therefore, be perfect. Even your Father, who's in the heavens, is perfect, which is in heaven. Young's, of course, corrects the error, translates it correctly with a future tense verb. So this is telling us, this, you know, some people have looked at this and thought, well, I had these commands, and now it's commanding me to be perfect. It's not commanding you to be perfect. It's telling you, you shall be perfect. It's going to be the, it's a statement of the results of you carrying out the commands. This is, of course, a very important why we have to look up verbs. You never have any idea that that's what it's talking about. We've got to check things out because there's so many errors in the translations. So you shall be perfect as the Father is perfect when you love, you bless, you do good, and you pray for others. In Matthew chapter 19, we see over in verse 21, Jesus said to him, this is this one uh, young ruler, he said, well, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Well, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. What's that tell you? They were his source. They were like an idol in his life. His possessions were. That was his problem. He had kept the commands, but he had an idol in his life. He, was, he had the, the possessions. And so he says, if you will, this is really the verb here, the main verb. If you are willing, present tense, to be, this is an infinitive in the Greek, to be, infinitive, if you are willing continually to be perfect, Otherwise, he's saying to them, you know, 
You, you, you haven't quite met, a, met this condition here yet. If you are really willing to be perfect, go and sell that you have. You've got to get rid of this, which is like an idol in your life that you look to, your source. It's not that we have to get rid of our money or possessions. It depends on whether the possessions have you. If they have you, you better turn loose of it because it's become an idol in your life. And he said, give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come. This is a command and follow me. Not only tell, told him to get rid of the possessions, but he also said, if, if you're willing to be perfect, you're going to have to come and follow me. Otherwise, you, he, he didn't want to let go of his possessions. He certainly wouldn't want to leave them and go and follow Jesus. So you and I must get rid of anything that becomes we're holding on to other than following the way of the Lord. He had to get rid of that in order to be able to come and follow him. So you can't have any idols or anything hindering you from following Jesus if you are going to become perfect. We see in Luke chapter 1, verse 45. Luke chapter 1, verse 45. This is speaking of Mary here. Blessed is she that believed. She believed the word that the angel brought to her. For that there shall be a performance this is a form of the word for the perfecting, the completing or the perfecting of those things that were told her from the Lord or the accomplishment of them. You see, going on to perfection is the accomplishment of the Lord's work in your life to bring you into the very image of Jesus Christ. So here, she believed the word. And because she believed the word, you said, well, there shall be a performance or a perfecting of those things that were told you from the Lord. They're going to be, they're going to be accomplished. What does that tell you? If you're going to see the perfecting work of God be accomplished, you've got to believe the word. You've got to believe the word and do what he says. And God will perform that word just like it was to be performed in her life, the things that were spoken in like manner, the things that God has said that he will perform for you, will be performed in your life, and you will come to perfection. So you must believe the word. What you do with the word is essential. If you don't believe the word, you doubt, you waver, you draw back from it, you don't carry it out, you're not going to go on to perfection. This word is the word of the covenant that we're expected to perform, and the accomplishment of it is to come. Remember, we're not to see one promise being left us of entering into his rest, and coming into his rest is seeing the work done, which is coming into spiritual perfection in our life. Over in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above his master. Everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So, you and I are disciples. And what makes us a disciple? Remember, that's because we have fruit, more fruit, we've gone through the cleansing process, and we have much fruit. And we continue in the word. Because the ones who continue the word are the disciples. The ones who have come to the abiding place in the, in the Lord, in the word, are the ones that are the true disciples of the Lord. So, these are the ones that are following after him. Everyone that is perfect or that has been perfected, more really is what they're saying, everyone that has been perfected and seen this work be accomplished. The reason why we say that is because it's a perfect tense verb. Everyone who has been perfected, is what this is saying, shall be as his master. Otherwise, you're going, to see a, you're going to come into perfection because you're going to do all the things that Jesus did. And you're going to follow everything that he tells you to do. And when this word talks about perfect, this is a word means, it's a little different word, it means to be perfectly fit, thoroughly prepared, fully qualified, fully adequate, and proficient. God has done this work in you to bring you to the place of being just like the master. You're going to do the same things that he did. You're going to walk that same walk. You are going to go through the things that Jesus did, and you're going to go on to be perfected in your life, to see the perfection of the Lord be accomplished. Otherwise, you're not going to bypass the things that Jesus went through it's in the sense of being tempted and, and doing the works and having to work out your own salvation. You're going to have to do the same thing. And God's going to do the work in you. We see over in... Luke chapter 8, verse 14. This is in the parable of the sower. 
In the parable of the sower, that's where the word is sown to produce fruit. And in the first type of ground, the, the enemy came and took it out because they didn't understand it. In the second type, they believed for a while, but in the time when the affliction, the persecution came, they stood away from it, time of temptation, they backed off of it, and they didn't see the fruit come forth. This is the third type of ground in Luke 8, 14. That which fell among thorns are they which, when they've heard, they go forth and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. That shows you, if you're going to go on into perfection, remember, you've got to be a disciple, you've got to have much fruit. Otherwise, fruit's important. As we've said several times, God's a fruit inspector, and if you're going to go on to perfection, you're going to bring forth fruit. In fact, you're not going to bring forth just a little fruit. You're going to bring much fruit. We talked about how God is at work to bring us to be a increasing greatly and abounding. We start out small, like we saw that scripture in Job 8, 7, and we're a greatly, our latter end is to greatly increase and abound. And that's what he'll do as we follow him. So, you can't let these things affect you. This will stop you from moving on into perfection. Cares of this world. Cares, the word merimna, means cares, worries, and anxieties. You and I are commanded to be anxious for nothing. Why would you be anxious if God is your total source and you got all these promises and he's given you authority and power and every weapon and you can, walk, you don't, you can conquer everything in your life? We would have our eyes on him and do what he says. We should have no cares, worries, or anxieties about anything unless we're looking at other things instead of the Lord. Riches. Don't think about the riches of this world. The things you have are just things that God gives you to use while you're walking through this life. The real riches are the riches of Christ that you and I want to obtain and all the things that God has for us in our life. So don't get your eyes on riches because that becomes an idol. That was what the problem was with the young ruler, rich run, young ruler. And then pleasures of this life, desires for pleasure. So the world is shouting at you, please me, come over here and I'll please you, and trying to, of course, get your money and use your time and all your efforts and so forth. The pleasures of this life, will all these things will choke out the word and bring no fruit to perfection. This, of course, tells you, if you're going to bring fruit to perfection and go on into perfection, you've got to have the word working in your life. The word, hearing, doing it consistently is the key. So, do not let cares of this world, anxieties of anything, deceitfulness of riches, lusts or pleasures of life enter in. If so, they will hinder you from going on to perfection. Fruit is absolutely necessary for you to go on to perfection. Remember, fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. In John chapter 4, we see over in verse 34, Jesus said, he said to him, My meat, or my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish, complete, perfect his work. Bring to completion, accomplishment, which is all about what this perfection is. Perfection is the accomplishment of the work of God in your life to bring everything that he purposes. So, he said, I'm to do the will of him that sent me. And I am to finish, accomplish, complete, see the perfecting of his work. See all this be accomplished. So, what's going to be the way that you're going to see that work finished? You're going to do the will of him that sent you. Doing the will of the Father, doing the will of the Word of God, the Word of God, which is the will of God, is essential. Remember, it says, those who want, many will say all these things and what they did, but he says only those that are doing the will of the Father are going to enter in. It's only those ones. So, doing the will of the Father, because you're going to see the work be accomplished. You're going to see the work be finished. You're going to see the work of complete, completed in you to bring forth the perfecting will of God. So again, doing the will of God and carrying out everything and finishing his, doing his works as well to see this work be accomplished. So this is why putting the word first place in your life is essential. That's why you hear us say all the time, be a hearer and a doer of the word. People that do, will, will not do that, they'll never see the perfecting work of God come forth in their life. Never. It'll never happen. John chapter 17, verse 4. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I finished, I completed the work which you gave me to do. What are we to do? We're to glorify him on this earth. 
We're to glorify him in everything that we do. And we are to see the finish, finishing of the work that he's given us to do. All the things that he's commanded us to do, we need to carry it out. He's called you to be a witness. He's called you to preach the gospel. He's called you to cast out the demons, heal the sick. He's called you to be light. He's called you all so many things that you're supposed to go forth and do. He called you to pray. All the things that he's called us to do. And we talked about the call of God on our life and how it's so important to fulfill that. All the things that he's given you to do, you need to carry it out. So as you bring glory unto him in doing all the things that he's commanded you to do, you're going to go on into see that finished work done and be perfected in the Lord. Verse 23. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect, he says, that they may be, and this is a subjunctive, again, it's dependent upon you meeting the conditions, present tense, that you may be ongoing, made perfect, or come to the place of perfection and completion. And again, this is a passive voice. God's going to do the work. He will do this work. So I in them and thou in me that they may be, may come to this place of being made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So it shows you that this perfecting work is going to come as you come into one with the Father and one with Jesus. That work being accomplished in you. That's why if you don't live unto him, how are you ever going to come into one with him? It's not going to happen. If you're living into yourself, you'll never see the perfecting, perfecting work be accomplished in your life. The key is to live unto him. Then you're living unto the, uh, the Lord, and you're going to be I and them, thou and me, you know, as Jesus did. He, he just totally did everything the Father told him to do. And we were going to be made perfect in one. Perfection comes when you become one with the Lord. And it's not talking about just getting born again and just having the same spirit of Christ. It's talking about seeing this work be accomplished in you, that you become like Jesus. That's what we're to become. It talks about in 1 John about when we come, we're going to be as he is. We're going to be just like he is because the work, perfecting work is going to be accomplished in our life. Acts chapter 20. Now you can tell, you say, is this going to happen for all the Christians? It's supposed to, but it's not because only a few are going to do what he says. The many are not going to do it, unfortunately, because they're not living under the Lord. They're doing their own thing. Only the few will be in this company that are going to be perfected. Acts 20, verse 24. None of these things move me, neither count on my, my life. And here it's talking about his, his suke, soul realm life, dear unto myself. Otherwise... I'm not following my agenda, and it doesn't matter what's coming at me. I'm not going to be moved by it. That I might finish my course with joy. Otherwise, my eyes are on the Lord. I've got to finish the work. I've got to complete the work. I've got to see this perfecting, completing accomplishment of the work of the Lord done in my life, in my course with joy, in the ministry which God's given, which I've received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel, the grace of God. In other words... I got to finish this call on my life. I got to carry it out. The call of God, you need to complete it. Remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. The ones that are chosen are the ones that have seen the call of God be fulfilled in their life. We're going to go on to perfection. Nothing moves us. We're not looking at our soul realm life and wanting to hold on to anything, thinking, in fact, when he says it's dear unto myself, it's interesting, the word dear actually means as of a great price. No, life is all in Jesus, not all this soul realm stuff of what I want to do, what I feel like doing, my thoughts and, and so forth. No, we live unto him and that's the key. I guarantee you, you'll never come into perfection if you don't live unto the Lord. We do not live unto ourselves. We only live unto him. Another thing that's important is Romans chapter 12, we see. Romans chapter 12, in verse 2. Well, first one we could comment on. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, you know your body, your flesh, has sin dwelling in it. 
So how can I present it wholly acceptable to God? I don't let sin operate through it, even though it's dwelling in it. So what do I do? I crucify the flesh daily. I put to death the deeds of the body. I do not let the sin that dwells in the flesh rise up and take control. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you walk after the lust of the flesh, then your body will not be presented holy. Instead, you'd be unholy. See, our body is to be presented holy, which is acceptable unto God. It's our reasonable service. And then he comes on to verse 2 and he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed, changed into another form. The word metamorpho, from which we get our word metamorphosis, change in species from caterpillar to a butterfly. That means you're going to be changed from a carnal-minded person to a spiritual-minded, from earthly-minded to heavenly-minded. From walking in the flesh, no, you're going to walk in the Spirit. That's where your mind is going to be after the things of the Spirit. And you, by the absolute change, renovation and complete change of your mind, your mind has to be gutted from all the ways that you have thought. And if you are allowing things to come into your mind uh, that are programming you continually the ways of the world, you're going nowhere. You're to be transformed by the complete change and renovation of your mind. You will never get to perfection if you continue to feed yourself the things of the world, the things of the flesh, all these negative things and so forth. No, you need to shut that off and turn off all the things of the world that are worthless and get your mind renewed to the Word. You need the Word in you. Remember, in the New Testament, he takes the Word, he writes it in your heart, he writes it in your mind. It's being inscribed in your mind by the Holy Spirit. And he goes on and says that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, which means well-pleasing, and perfect or perfecting will of God. So, that tells you that the will of God is going to bring a perfection in your life, a perfecting. These are not different types of the will of God. Some people have read this and say, well, there's the good, there's the acceptable, and there's the perfect. That's not so. These are all adjectives in the Greek. It's not nouns describing different types of the will of God. They're adjectives describing the one will of God. You're either in the will of God or you're not. What's the will of God? The Word. The will of God is good. The will of God is well-pleasing and acceptable. And the will of God will accomplish the perfecting work in your life. How's it going to happen? Because you get your mind renewed to the truth. And you're going to think on what God wants. It's going to affect your will, your choices, and everything that you do. You're, not going, to, you're going to think as a heavenly minded. You're going to, have to get the mind of Christ. So you think like him. And you can't, don't, don't think by any means that some people have taught out there, well, I'm just going to believe that I have the mind of Christ. <laughs> Believing you have the mind of Christ will not produce the mind of Christ. That's fantasy. That's all unreality, false religious teaching. A lot of people say, well, I'm just believing I have the mind of Christ. Or they think they got it because they're born again. No, you don't have the mind of Christ until your mind's renewed. And the measure it's been renewed is the measure that you have seen, seen the mind of Christ come into you. So, we've got to get complete renovation of our mind if we're going to come to this perfect, see the perfecting work of the will of God happen and bring us into perfection. Therefore, you've got to get your mind renewed. You don't get your mind renewed, are you ever going to come to perfection? No. Are you going to have the mind of Christ so you will think like God wants? No. Are you going to have a spiritual mind? Your heavenly mind? No. You're going to be filled with all this worldly stuff and, and fleshly stuff, and it's going to take you nowhere. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Going on to perfection. God wants to take us all into perfection. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. We are speaking wisdom. This is an a ongoing uh, present tense verb. He's speaking wisdom among them that are perfect. So what that tells us is the fact that wisdom is going to produce this perfection in our life because wisdom is the result of having knowledge. When you act on the knowledge, you get spiritual understanding. And when you walk in that, it produces wisdom. Wisdom knows what to do in every situation. 
you need wisdom. The, it says in the Proverbs, get wisdom. It's the principal thing. Wisdom is all tied into everything. Solomon had great wisdom, and what did it do? It produced everything for him. It produces prosperity. It produces all these blessings. When you have wisdom, you know what to do, and it will produce all the results in your life. So he's speaking wisdom among those who are perfect. They're going to be able to receive it, it will, and it will bring forth the working of the Lord in your life to produce this. The wisdom of the world, the princes of the world that come to naught, they, no, that doesn't do it at all. It's the wisdom of God that produces this in your life. Also, so we've got to get wisdom by hearing and doing the word. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Why would we all speak the same thing? Because we all think the same way. Why would we all be thinking the same way? Because we all have the mind of Christ. If we're not thinking the same way, somebody might be right, somebody might be wrong, or maybe both are wrong, but we're obviously not in one accord. Why? Because we're not thinking like Jesus wants us to think. We're to be speaking the same thing. There's be no divisions among you. That was a major problem in Corinth. They had all kinds of divisions and problems. What do we see in the body of Christ today? <laughs> Division all over the place. So, that's why there's only going to be a few, unfortunately, that are going to come to this place of speaking the same thing, no divisions among them, that will really have the mind of the Lord. And that you be perfectly joined together, perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's what's going to happen. Because if you don't think like Jesus, you're not going to have the mind of Christ, you're not going to be like Him, and you're not going to go on to perfection. Well, if we're all having the same mind and we're thinking like Jesus, that means our mind's been renewed. So they're to be perfectly, or to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Judgment refers to the, the, your view or your way of thinking, your mind, your purpose, your intentions, your way of thinking, your perception, your, your way of dealing with situations. Because we're going to do it according to the Word of God and handle things that will bring forth a good results. That's why our thinking is so important. Here's another scripture regarding our thinking. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children, this is a young child, in understanding. He wants to grow up in our understanding. We're to increase in it. How be it in malice or having ill will, should we be doing that? No. He says, be, at, be it like children. This is nepiazo, is the Greek word, being like an infant. Well, do infants do anything? No, they haven't grown up enough to do anything. So he's saying, as far as doing any evil things, you're like an infant, you don't do them. Essentially, it's a funny way to say it in a sense, but it's saying don't do it. But in understanding now, and this is talking about the faculty of being able to perceive and to judge things correctly, to be able to see and to know what's, what's the right thing, the correct way of thinking, he says... Be men, but that's not what it says in the Greek. It says, be perfect. This is the word for being perfect. Growing up to perfection. And that's why Young's translates it correctly. In fact, the word be here is not be, it's become. It's the word ginomai. He's telling us to become perfect. Because that's what we're to develop in. And this is a command. Command given to us. God would never command us something that we couldn't see result per, per, coming to pass in our life. And that's a present tense. So he's commanding us to become, on an ongoing basis, those that are perfect because it's going to develop in us. And this is because we have the perception, the correct way of thinking, understanding, so that we'll walk in the ways of the Lord. And as you're, so you're, you'll have a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. You'll become perfect in your way of thinking what it's talking about. Another thing that's important for us to come to the place of perfection is remember who's going to be presented to the Lord? The ones that are holy, right? Well, 2 Corinthians 7.1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, the holy ones are going to be presented to Jesus. That means they have gone on to perfection. 
So how do we get to this perfection? Because it refers to it to the perfecting holiness. The holiness of the result of perfection in your life in the fear of God. Well, we got these promises. So what should we, first of all, we got to know the promises. If you don't spend time in the Word and know the promises, you're not even going to be able to be going for possessing something that God has, has made available for you. All these succeeding great and precious promises that we're supposed to possess. So you've got to know the promises. Well, how are we going to possess the promises? We've got to get cleansed of the things that would hinder us. So what are we getting cleansed of? All the filthiness of the flesh. All fleshly works have to be eliminated. Anything that's of the human nature flesh, it's got to be gone. It's got to go. And spirit, what's the filthiness of the spirit? Spirit is, hell filthiness of spirit's not talking about our spirit because our spirit is right. We got a new, brand new spirit on the inside of us, the spirit of Christ. And we receive the Holy Spirit who dwells in our spirit. Nothing evil or filthy in our spirit. What's the filthiness of the spirit? It's the unclean evil spirits that are in us. They're called unclean spirits some 20 times in the Gospels. So they're filthy, they're unclean. Filthy spirits. So, what is going to bring you to the place of perfection in holiness? To be holy. Perfection. <coughs> got to deal with all the fleshly things, and you also got to cast out all the demons, because the filthiness of spirit of the evil spirits. What does that tell you? Only those that have dealt with the filthiness of the flesh and cast out the demons are ever going to come to the place of perfection, of holiness, and they'll have the fear of God. Oh, boy, that makes a whole lot of people in trouble because what's the body of Christ teach out there? We don't have any demons in us. They're all gone when we're born again, you know. Ninety-plus percent of the body of Christ out there doesn't believe they have any demons in them. <laughs> Will they ever get to perfection? Nope, because everybody's got them in them because we've all sinned. We all have them from inheritance, our own sins and victimization. Therefore, only those who deal with the flesh filthiness and deal with the evil spirits, filthiness, casting them all out. That's another requirement for you to go on into perfection to be holy before the Lord, and you're going to have the fear of the Lord before you. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we see something else. Here in verse 7, this is Paul. Paul got all this great revelation from the Father. And he says in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure, God was trying to exalt him as he was going and preaching the gospel every place. Through the abundance of the revelations, remember he got all these revelations of all the things that happened, the cross of the throne, all the spiritual revelation, wrote all, in all these letters. He got this revelation. Lest I should be exalted. Now some people, even some translations, have translated it that Paul was trying to exalt himself. Some translations have talked about him uh, being, being prideful and being conceited. You look through the translations and you'll see how they even translate it that way, which is totally incorrect. Because when it talks about being exalted here, lest I should be exalted, was he trying to exalt himself? No. How do you know? Because it's a passive voice. He was being exalted by somebody else. Well, who exalts us in due time? The Lord does, remember? If you be humbled under the mighty hand of the Lord, he will exalt you in due time. Well, God was now wanting to exalt him in the eyes of all the people with all the revelation he had, so he was going to go and preach the revelation. And what was the devil trying to do? Stop him every city he went to. City after city, they were trying to hinder him when he first started out. Lest I should be exalted by the Lord above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, or really, uh, this is talking about be because of the, all these revelations that he got that he wants to bring forth, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. What was the thorn in the flesh? The messenger, which is the word angelos, which means an angel of Satan to buffet me. So an evil spirit was working, sent at him to buffet him. And the buffet means to strike at him, blow after blow after blow continually. And this was ongoing. Now, one thing you have to know, did this have to happen? No. Was it God's will for it to happen? No. Could it have been prevented? Yes. How do you know? Because when it says the messenger of Satan to buffet me, notice, it's a subjunctive mood verb. 
which means he could only buffet him if conditions were met, which meant if he didn't know how to deal with the devil, the devil could beat him up and buffet him left and right. And Paul did not know how to deal with the devil yet at this point. He was growing in his uh, development of his life, it's just like everybody else in his spiritual walk. So when it talks about this, this buffeting, the messenger of Satan was sent, if the conditions were such that he could do it, to continually strike at him, blow after blow after blow after blow. And what was the purpose? Lest I should be exalted above measure. Same thing, it's passive voice, meaning that, so to stop him from seeing God exalt him. And of course, this is also subjunctive mood. It was conditional upon you know, that he wasn't automatic that he'd be exalted because the devil could stop him, which is what was happening. First missionary journey, he's getting beat up left and right. So he's, he, was got, he was being hindered by the devil from being exalted with all the abundance of revelations. Yet the attack from the enemy was a conditional thing. If he knew what to do about it, he could have stopped it. So having said that, we come to verse 8. What did he do about it? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He asked him three times to get rid of this thing. This means he was calling, just simply calling and speaking to the Lord for the Lord to get rid of it. Is that the way we get rid of the things of the devil? No. Because God has given us authority and he told us to speak to the devil, cast him out, resist him, bind him, speak to the mountain to be removed. We have the authority. Paul didn't know all these things yet. This is one of the earlier letters, the ones to the Corinthians. He was developing in these things. So, he seeks the Lord to depart three times and nothing's happening. Then we come and here's the Lord's response. Many people have not understood this. He said unto me, my grace, now what's the grace of God? God's favor towards you. Is the favor of God just for you to get beat up by the devil? and have to be under the devil's, you know, continual pummeling you, blow after blow after blow. That's not the favor of God. The favor of God is what brings your deliverance and your freedom and your blessing and all the promises of God to pass, not being pummeled by the enemy. My favor, it says, is sufficient. This word sufficient is a word archaeo in the Greek. And what it says means... It doesn't mean to put up with this stuff. My grace is sufficient for you to just put up with the devil beating you up left and right. No. My favor that will bring my blessings, which the favor of God does, is for thee. And what, is this, what does this sufficient mean? It causes you to be possessed with unfailing strength. That's what the word means. To be able to defend and ward off the enemy. That's what the word means. Otherwise, my grace gives you the unfailing strength and the ability to defend and ward off the enemy. Otherwise, you don't have to put up with this stuff, Paul. Because remember, it was a conditional statement. You can conquer this guy. You don't have to let this thing, this evil spirit, buffet you continually, even though you know, he didn't understand these things yet. So he goes on and he makes a statement, for my strength, that's the word dunamis, my power, that's God's power. Hey, if God's power comes in operation, is it going to defeat the enemy? You better believe it. God's power just doesn't show up and then the enemy pummels you and so forth. When God's power comes on the scene, hey, the enemy's going to be driven out. My power, aha, whenever God's power, you know it's going to do something, is made perfect, it's perfected, and completed and put into operation to accomplish things, which is what this is all talking about, in weakness. What weakness? His want of strength and weakness. Where did he have no strength and ability to deal with it? In the flesh. In himself, in the flesh, he couldn't do anything. But how about in spirit? He sure could. He could conquer the enemy. He had authority and dominion over all the power of the enemy. God's power is made perfect or accomplished and, and brought into manifestation to produce a result in the midst of his weakness. What weakness? His weakness in the flesh. 
He was weak in the flesh, but the power of God could come upon him to enable him to conquer the enemy, ward him off, defend himself against him. Most gladly, he see, this is when he, see, he understood this at this point. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weaknesses. Infirmities is the same word. Weakness up here, notice it. This particular word, 769. Infirmities should be the same thing, weakness. Otherwise, most gladly, I will rather glory in my weaknesses or lack of strength. And where do we have lack of strength? In the Spirit? No, our Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Hey, he's, we're victorious there. In the flesh, we got no strength. You can't do anything in the flesh. You would go nowhere. So, my power is perfected and accomplished and made perfect, comes into operation to produce results, essentially, in the midst of your weakness of the flesh. He's going to glory in his weaknesses in the flesh. Hey, it doesn't bother me that I have weakness in the flesh. And I realize I have weakness in the flesh. So that doesn't matter because I'm not going to operate in the flesh. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Otherwise, the power of God, and this is the form of the word skinoo, episkinoo, which means to tabernacle. It's going to dwell or tabernacle upon me. Otherwise, the power of God was going to rest on him and manifest in him so that he then could conquer his enemies. Because he's going to use his, the power, remember, to ward off and defend with unfailing strength to overcome the attacks of the enemy. So he would not be able to get to him. This is what it's saying. Unfortunately, people have not understood this because they have not looked up the words and they just assumed that God was saying that, you know, you're supposed to put up with it because you're some weak old thing and you can go nowhere. No, that's ridiculous. No, if the power of Christ rests on you, does that mean the devil's going to pummel you? Absolutely not. When the power of God's involved, you're going to win. You're gonna, this enemy's going to be smitten. People have not understood this. So, you can have the power of Christ on you, of course. Therefore, he says, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities, persecution, distresses for Christ's sake. It doesn't matter what's coming at me. When I am weak here, again, when I have this weakness in the flesh, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> then I am powerful. Dunatos. I'm powerful. Where am I powerful? In spirit. Where am I weak? In flesh. Depends on how you deal with it. How did Paul decide, try to deal with things at the first? He tried to deal with it in the flesh. He tried to do everything possible in the flesh to deal with the things. And, and asking God, of course, to get rid of it, but he didn't understand about operating in the spirit to conquer the enemies with the power of God, the unfailing strength, and the ability to defend and ward off the enemy. That's exactly what he did. So he realized, even though I got this weakness in the flesh, I got the strength of Jesus Christ. I got the power of God that will rest on me through in the spirit and I can conquer all these enemies and overcome them in my life. Therefore, you got to know that how, how is he going to come to the place of getting free of the enemy? Through the power of God. You got to get full of the power of God. You're going to get full of the power of God because you put on the whole armor of God. Through the word in you, it produces the power resident within you. You do nothing in the flesh. If you look to the flesh to try to deal with your problems, you'll be like him. You'll get pummeled left and right, buffeted over and over and over by the enemy. But if you operate according to the power of Christ, you get the power of God resident in you, and you, manifest, you release the manifest power of God with mighty force by praying with all manner of prayer and using your authority, you'll smite the enemy and see him be put underfoot and eliminated every single time. Therefore, Another way to go into perfection is you can't let the devil beat you up. How can you be in perfection if the devil's pummeling you left and right? No, it's because you're going to pummel him. You're going to put him underfoot. You're going to get full of the power of God. Remember Stephen was full of the power of God, full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. We've already seen several of those things. And what did he do? He went forth and he got victory over the enemies. He did the mighty, wonderful works of the Lord. So, we took time to go through that because there's been such absolute false teaching about Paul's thorn out there. It's astounding. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. We are glad, rejoicing, when we are weak, because we got this weakness of flesh. It doesn't affect us at all. 
that affect me that I can't do anything to conquer the enemy in the flesh. And you are strong, otherwise you guys have power. This also we wish, even your perfection. Otherwise, he's talking about, and the word wish really means to pray. We're praying your perfection, which is that you are strong. Because what's going to produce the perfection and the victory in your life? This is, again, this is the word dunatos, which really means powerful and mighty and strong. Otherwise, you're going to go on to perfection in your life. You're going to get mighty. You're going to be full of power. You're going to be, have strength. And you're going to conquer everything. Nothing's going to overcome you. You are going to be strong in the Lord, and you are going to walk in victory in your life. So here, you know, we, we'd be praying for another to get full of the power of God, which is what produces their perfection. He says, you know, you're strong. this is what we pray, which is for your perfection, to bring it to pass in your life. Then we come down to verse 13. He says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. This is a command. And when he makes this commanding statement, this is something that they can't do themselves. How do you know? Because it's a passive voice. If it was him producing it, it would be an active voice, the subject doing it. It's a command, imperative, and it's present tense. So he's commanding them. You are to be perfect. Who's going to do it? God's going to do it. He's going to bring you into perfection. It's to be continually in operation. And it's a command. God's command is to be that way. That's why, because you have him working in you to produce this, if you allow him to work. <coughs> then he commands them to be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you, as they met the conditions. So, we're going to be perfected continually by God as we obey his command of doing the things that he says, which, of course, get full of the power of God, operate according to it, in line with it. Galatians chapter 5, here's another scripture, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill, this is this word teleo, which is a form of this word perfection, you will not fulfill or see come to perfection or completion or its works be accomplished, the lust of the flesh. Do we have the lust of the flesh at all times? Yes, we got the flesh, flesh and it has all its lusts. Do we have to let it manifest in any way? No. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not see the completion, the accomplishment, the result, the, the perfecting of the lust of the flesh operate in your life. So what's going to be another way we're going to come into perfection? We've got to walk in the Spirit at all times. You can't be walking in the flesh. You'll never come to perfection. We are going to walk in the Spirit. And how do you walk in the Spirit? According to what is, a, what, is the, what is Spirit? The Word of God is what is Spirit, and it is life. You're going to walk by your Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, in line with the Word of God, and you're going to do what the Word says, walk it in the Spirit, and you're not even going to let the flesh have opportunity to work at all times, at, uh, at any time whatsoever. Another thing we see in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. This is this word katerizo, which is a form, was translated perfection several times. Restore such a one in the spirit of weakness, spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So here it's speaking about seeing a, a, a restoration or someone be restored, repaired, come back to be made whole, sound, complete. And it really means to be, someone life's been broken, uh, to be repaired. So we're to be repaired, mended. It's all what this word kind of implies. So this is going to tell you another thing. What else is going to bring you to perfection? You've got to be, you got to be restored. You've got to be repaired. You've got to be healed. You've got to get delivered of everything. You aren't going to be perfected if you're running around with hurts, wounds, and all this negative stuff. God wants to heal you of every evil thing that's happened in your life. No hurts, no wounds. We're going to get rid of them all. You don't put up with them. You don't manage your problems. You don't manage your anger and all these things. You get rid of them all. You get restored. You get healed. You cast out all the demons. You get your mind renewed. God will heal you, restore you, deliver you. It's all going. We don't manage anything. Manager, people that try to manage, that's what the world does, manage things. <laughs> try to live with them and put up with them. No, 
We throw them out and get rid of them. So total restoration, repair, elimination of all of the enemies out of your life. Mandatory. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Verse 11, well, verse 11 talks about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And what are they doing? For the perfecting of the saints. Not just to give them a bunch of messages that's not going to do anything for them. Not to just give them one scripture or two scriptures and then go ramble and talk about all the things that they're doing and talk about their vacation and their family and tell some jokes and all this ridiculous stuff. <laughs> These guys need to retire or quit. They're kicked out, really, as far as God's concerned, because they're not doing what God says. Their purpose is the perfecting of the saints. How do you do that? Through the Word. Giving them the Word. For the work of the ministry. How can they do the work of the ministry? They've got to know the Word. They've got to be walking in line with the Word. For the edifying of the body of Christ. What's going to edify and build up the body of Christ? The works of God being done through the Word. The Word springing forth freedom and liberty in our life. So, the perfecting of the saints is supposed to happen. This is going to happen through the fivefold ministry, the true ones, not the ones that are out there doing what they're doing. We're talking about the true apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that are bringing forth the word and the ministry gift in their life is operating through them to accomplish this work through the word and for the perfecting of the saints. And who's going to do the work of the ministry? The saints are. For the edifying of the body of Christ, you and I are all to do the work of the ministry. It'll produce the edifying. Until we all come, does that mean it's going to automatically happen? Nope. How do we know? Because this is a subjunctive mood verb. Conditional. Till we may all come. It depends on whether you see this work be a perfecting work be accomplished in your life and you do the work of the ministry, and you are involved in the edifying of the body of Christ. Otherwise, you're, you're carrying this out. Till we may or might all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge, and this is also, you're going to operate in faith, obviously, to come to perfection, and you're also going to get the precise, correct knowledge of God to come to perfection. You can't be doing things contrary to the Word and think it's going to produce anything. It produces nothing. The precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God unto what? What is this all to produce? The perfect man. Who's that? That is the grown-up man in Christ. The one that's come out of babyhood, come out of being an infant, come out of being a child, the young man who's conquered the enemy, comes to spiritual manhood. The per perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness. That means everything of Jesus is operating. The church is going to be a glorious church and the, the, the power of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the fullness of Jesus Christ is going to come forth. This isn't just nice little words that will never happen. Everything that God says is going to happen. But who's going to be a part of it? Unfortunately, not everybody. Only the remnant who, who get this work done. Only the people who come to the, be the perfect man. The perfect man is going to be the ones that show forth the fullness of Christ. So, if you don't go on to perfection, you'll never be in the stature of the fullness of Christ. But if you do go on to perfection, you will come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. When we come to this, according, operating according to the knowledge of God and, and operating in faith, we henceforth be no more children. This is the word nepios. We're not going to be infants any longer, inexperienced in the word of God. No, we're doers of the word. We're developed in the Word. We're going to become strong and effective, efficient, actively work in the Word. And also, we're not going to be all confused about doctrine. Well, it's the truth over here. No, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Yeah, they're blow, the doctrines blow all, they've been blowing all over the place in the body of Christ for years. Why? Because the people have never studied the whole Word. They take a scripture here and make a, a doctrine out of it, and they think they've ignored other scriptures and so forth. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Speaking the truth, bringing forth the teaching the truth in love, that we may grow up. Again, spiritual growth. We talked about this verse in the past. Is this automatically because you hear the truth? No. It's what you do with the truth. 
just because you heard the truth spoken to you in love, well, great. Now you've got something to work on, to do, but if you don't do it, it won't cause you to grow up. It's subjunctive mood. It means the growing up is because you put the word in operation, you apply it, you do what it says so that you will grow up. Into him in all things, not just a few things. God, it wants you and I to grow up into him in all things. What does that mean? You're going to become like Jesus. You're going to think like him, you're going to walk like him, you're going to do everything like him. You're going to be just like Jesus on the inside of you, operating through you, because you're going to have the fruit. You're going to have the mind of Christ. You're going to have the wisdom of God. You're going to have the power of God. You're going to be operating in his ways, which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body, and here we are again, fitly joined together. We're not talking about ones all, we're all over the place. No, we're speaking the same thing. We're thinking the same way. We have the same view. We're perfectly joined together. We saw in 1 Corinthians 1.10, fitly joined together, compacted that by which every joint supplies. That means everybody's important. Everybody is involved in doing what they're supposed to do. You know, part of your body, you know, if this body was well, part, part of the body is not doing anything. What's wrong with this part of the body? They're not doing what they should be doing. No, it's not going to function right, will it? Every part of your body is to function. Every part of the body of Christ is the function. Every one of you is important. Every joint supply, whatever you, God's called you to do, he wants you to supply the things that he has given you. The call of God, all the things. The power of God's to be in all of us. Every one of us should be operating in power. Every one of us should be casting out demons. Every one of us should be healing the sick. Every one of us should be giving counsel and teaching others and encouraging others and operating as, as Jesus would operate. According to the effectual working, this is the word energy a, which means the active operation, effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase. Remember we talked about increase, how God wants us to increase greatly and abound. Makes increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Meaning, we're all going to grow up. And as we grow up, we're going to be edifying and increasing every, everybody else. We're encouraging them. That's why if you're not speaking encouraging words in the word to people, there's something wrong. You don't be speaking negative and critical and tearing people down and fault finding and talking about all their negatives and all these things. <laughs> That's a destructo. No, you're only gonna speak good things. You're gonna speak things that people need to hear the word, to be an encourager, to be one who's comforting and ministering to people and giving them the word. And even when you correct them, you always do it with a spirit of meekness to help them to get on the right path. Otherwise, never be indestructive in any ways. Any of the strife, any of this judge, judgmental, negative, condescending attitudes, <laughs> that person's never going to grow up and go to perfection. No, we're going to grow up in all these things. So the Word of God, coming forth from the true fivefold ministry, brings a perfecting of the saints so that they do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this is to happen until we all might come, if we do what he says, to the unity of the faith and the precise correct knowledge of the Son of God, to the full man of the stature in Christ, to the perfect man, going on to perfection, for the fullness of Christ. And you and I are not going to be tossed with all these crazy doctrines. We're going to follow the doctrine of Christ, which is the Word of God. We're going to have it straight because we're going to study and rightly divide the Word of Truth. We're going to bring the Word on everything. And the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into what? All truth. So don't think you can't know all truth. We can know it all. You just have to take the time and study and learn. And it's no shortcuts to it. It's scripture after scripture, point after point, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's the only way. It doesn't come any other way. And we're going to, have to speak the truth in love. We're going to grow up in all things because we're going to act upon it. And we're going to be a part of the perfect man in Christ, working every part, bringing the edify and the increase of ourselves. And what's going to happen? We're going to get stronger and more powerful and more increasing, abounding fruit, all these things. We're going to grow up in all things. That's what God wants. Praise God. He's going to accomplish it. And this great work will be accomplished. We'll look at one more uh, passage just for a couple minutes before we're going to stop for tonight. Philippians 3, we were already over there before about Paul, about how, saying how he, remember he was touching the law blameless, 
And he realized in verse 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, because it didn't produce anything. It didn't produce perfection. It didn't produce anything in my life. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. The knowledge of God, bring of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, spiritual reality is what I want. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things, because <laughs> he threw all the things of the Old Testament out, which is what he was supposed to do, because it been that was all types and shadows pointing towards the reality, so we didn't need it anymore. Since the reality came, what are we following the types and shadows for? And all the physical stuff. And we got these people today that are going back into the Old Testament law and stuff. What are you doing in the Old Testament law with all of its types and shadows and these physical things? Let's come into the spiritual realities, the real deal. That's what he realized. I count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Found him not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. That's what Jesus brings to the place of knowing him. And the power of his resurrection, the power of God, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, because we die out to everything that's not of the Lord. And we have his life manifest in us. That by any means I might attain, this means to arrive, that I might arrive unto the resurrection of the dead. He's saying, this is all necessary so I can get to the place of being a part of the resurrection of the dead. Which means, if he doesn't get to this place, is he going to be a part of the resurrection of the dead? No, he's not going to get to that place. Not as though I'd already attained, or Lombano, taken hold of it. I haven't taken hold of this yet. So he's saying, hey, I haven't arrived and taken hold of all these things yet. Either we're already perfect. Paul says, I haven't got to perfection yet. Remember, he was a work in process like we all are. He's growing up in all these things. But what am I doing? I'm following after. And what are we doing following after? I'm not just going at a snail's pace, whenever I feel like it, if, it's, if it works at my schedule. No, I am running after Dioko. I am running after, I am running swiftly after this. Hey, I'm going, I'm running the race, you know. I'm, I'm, it's all out effort. That if that I may l l apprehend really means, catalambano means lay hold of. I might lay hold on that for which I am laid hold of of Jesus Christ. He took hold of us, now we are to take hold, we're bought with a price, remember, we belong to him. So now we are to lay hold of all the things that he set before us, which is all the promises to go on into spiritual perfection in our life. Brethren, I count not myself to have laid hold of it, same word. But this one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things that are behind. Fleshly stuff, worldly stuff, hurts and wounds, poor old me, negativism that happened, failures, all this stuff. Forget it. Get rid of it. All this stuff's, you know, pleasures of this life and all these things. And they're nothing. Watching the, the, all the things that come on the TV and the movies, they're just pouring filth into you. Throw them out. I'm forgetting the things behind. I don't want to know that. I don't want any of those pleasures of this life. None of it. Reaching forth under the things that are before. Reaching forth. It means he's stretching out himself. That's what this means. Hey, I'm, I'm running. I'm stretching for this. I am going after the real deal. The things that are before. And then he says, I press. This is the same word, Dioko. I am running swiftly toward the goal. The word mark means the goal. I'm going for the goal. What is that? For the prize. What's the prize? It's the award to the victor. I am running for the goal of the award to the victor. So that means, how am I going to get to that place? I got to get the victory. It only comes to the victor, which means I have to get the victory over the flesh. I got to get the victory over the world. I got to get the victory over the devil. I got to get the victory over anything, over sin, anything that would pull me down if I'm going to get there. I got to go on to perfection. I'm going for the award for the victor of the high calling of God. What's the high calling of God? Go into perfection. That's the high calling of God. Be without blemish, be holy, be one who's unrebukable, unreprovable in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, I'm running after this thing. He said, Let us therefore, as many as to be perfect, be thus minded. 
That's why you know it's about being perfect. Am I going to be perfect? I got to be thus minded with this. If you're not minded this way, you got a problem. You got the wrong mindset. Get rid of that mindset of all these things of the world. If your focus is on how what I like get in this world, you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. <laughs> that didn't help me anywhere. No. As many as be perfect, be thus minded. That's where our mindset is. So what are we doing? We're going to go to per on to perfection. We're going to run the race for the goal of the award to the victor because we're going to get the victory. And the way you get your victory is through Jesus Christ and all the things that he's given you in the word, through your faith and all the weapons and everything, the power of God, all the things that he's given to us. We can conquer all enemies and get the victory. The, and what is, the, what is the ultimately where we're headed? For perfection. We're minded to become perfect. We're minded to go on into perfection. So don't put up with anything that's not of the Lord in your life. Don't put up with any devils. Don't put up with any sin. Don't put up with anything of the flesh. Don't put up with anything of the world. Don't put up with anything that would try to pull you down. It's all designed to the devil. And the devil's your enemy. You've got to conquer him, and you're well able to. See, we're not going to put up with stuff. We're not going to put up with some devil buffing us. No. We're going to get the enemies out. Paul, aha, the power of God can rest on me even though i got this weakness of flesh that can do nothing. I, could care. I, I glory in my weaknesses. It means nothing. The power of Christ is going to operate in me. I'm going to operate in the Spirit. I'm going to walk in victory. If I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh is going nowhere. I'm putting this thing under. And actually, from here he goes on and he says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, wherever you've gotten to already, wherever you have gotten to, you come to arrive at. Otherwise, the work that's been done in your life, let us walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Keep walking that way. Keep having that same mind. Don't lose anything you've gained. Remember, you can lose the reward that you have if you don't hold on to it. You've got to hold fast to everything that you've, you've gained. Brother, be followers together in me and mark them that walk as we have for an example. Hey, we're running the race. We're out there going after the perfection. Many walk, he says, I've told you now, even telling you, weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Oh, this is the many, remember? Remember the many? They're in trouble. The few are the ones that are going to make it. What's the end? Destruction. They're born again, but they're the ones that are going to be destroyed. Why? Because their God's their belly. Their flesh is running them. You can't let your God, God, belly be your God. And their glories and their shame, they're mining earthly things. They're focused on all these things out there in the world and all the earthly things. They're going nowhere. Our mind is to be on heavenly things. And he goes on and he says, for our conversation, which refers to our citizenship, is in heaven. Where are you from? Well, I'm from somewhere on earth. No, you're not. You're from heaven. I am? Yeah, you got a brand new spirit. That's who you are. Where'd it come from? It came from above. It doesn't matter about the fleshly thing. Because you don't, you don't know people after the flesh anymore. You're supposed to know everything after the spirit. Why would you want to know things after the flesh? It produces nothing. Your citizenship is in the heavens. From whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to come back. Praise God. We're running the race going on to perfection. All these things that we've seen are going to take you into perfection. We haven't finished. We've got well, well, quite a bit more to go. We only got to, what, here in Philippians, and we've got the rest of the New Testament to go through. A lot of things. We'll finish it up on Wednesday night. God wants us to go into perfection. That's where Paul was headed, and that's where all these guys were, saying, hey, this is our mindset. We're minded to be, go on to perfection, and that's what we're going to be. And it would never, God would never set, tell you to go be perfect if you couldn't be. He's going to do the work. All we've got to do is live unto him, put the word of God first place, follow everything he says, and get rid of all this garbage. Get rid of everything of the world. Don't waste your time with all this stuff that's all going to be burnt up with a bunch of haywood and stubble and you're going to suffer loss. No, you don't want that. You want to en enter into all that God has for you. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God. 
that says, let us go on to perfection. Therefore, I am going on to perfection. I am going to run this race. I see the high calling of God, which is perfection, and my eyes are upon it. And that goal is before me and is attainable for the victor. The awards to the victor. Meaning I have to get the victory. And I can get the victory through Jesus Christ, who's going to do the work in me through the Word of God. So as I live my life in line with the Word, in the Spirit, and I do all that He says, I will see this perfecting work through the Word of God be accomplished in my life. And I will go on into perfection in my life. Thank you, Lord. I'm running that race, striving after it. I will see it. I'll reach the goal because I'm a doer of the word. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me in to perfection so that I will be holy without blemish, without spot. I will be unrebukable, unreprovable. I'll be a part of the glorious church. To be caught up to meet the Lord in the air means I could be one of the ones who will be there for the rapture of the church. Thank you, Lord. I'm going on to perfection. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You know, the bottom line is that the people that don't get to perfection, they don't get in the rapture. They won't be in it. You tell that to most Christians out there, they'll think you're crazy. But if you look at the Word of God, and you understand what it means to be per perfection, and you understand who God present, what Jesus presents to himself, that's the ones that have all come to perfection. Pretty clear. All these people are in trouble if they don't get on the right road. We're going to run the race. We're going to be one of the few. Encourage others to be that. We're going to walk that walk. We're going to run this race. Remember, our citizenship's in heaven. So we're going to live from heaven according to heaven's ways. Don't think that you're a citizen of this earth. You're not. You have switched. You have a brand new citizenship. You are from above. Praise God. Thank you, Father, for much fruit. As we are doers of this word. We're growing up in all things, and we're going on to perfection. We will increase. We will abound. We will greatly increase. We will have fruit, more fruit, much fruit. We are going to see you work everything in our life to bring us to all that you have. Thank you for the fulfillment of the high calling of God in each one of our lives as we go on to perfection. In Jesus' name.